Growing up, Lori Reynolds Paisley was not a fan of books or reading. It was only after falling in love and marrying a man who she describes as often buried in a book that she decided to ask him for a reading recommendation. Little did her husband know that his suggestion would ultimately turn his wife into a passionate book lover for whom everything from covers to characters would become integral parts of her life, her profession, and her purpose. So you start to read more fiction that has historical significance to it and books start to become what in your life? My best friends. Really? Mm -hmm. In what ways? Um, You know, I I learned from them. Um, Sometimes I felt like I had a connection to the characters. Sometimes they took me to places I hadn't ever been. And um, I could sit there and look at my bookshelf and remember exactly where I was. So some of them represented good times in my life. Some of them represented tough times in my life. And um, they're like friends to me. The characters are like friends. You know, the book covers are like friends. They just, they represent, you know, where I was at a certain time in my life. And so how did your passion for books or your growing interest in books and this evolution of, of your love of literature, where did it take you in your life? You said you worked in a bookstore? Yes. As my, uh, I was a CPA for years and years and years and traveled when my kids were young. And once we moved here to Indianapolis, um, I quit working and raised the kids. And as they got older, they didn't need me as much during the day, so I decided to go out and find myself something that I could do after they got on the bus and something that you know I could be home for when they got off the bus. And so I love, because I've learned to love books, I, I got a job at the local Barnes & Noble, and um, it opened a whole new world for me. In what way? Um, well, I could afford my books, so <laughs> I most of the time I, I left the bookstore with at least one book in my hand. I mean, all the time. I very rarely saw any financial you know, gains from, from working there. I met amazing people there. I was hired in Christmas of uh, 2005, I believe. And I didn't usually work nights. I usually worked during the days, but for some reason I was there at night. And it was around Christmas, early December, and this gentleman came in and asked for a copy of Christmas Jars by Jason Wright. And I looked, and our, we didn't have it in the store, so I ordered it for him. And I read the the reviews and you know what it was about and I thought wow that sounds like something I would like to read. So what were the reviews and what was it about? It's about a young um, girl who is aspiring to be a journalist and she comes into some rough times and um, she finds that she's been uh, left an anonymous gift Um, and she goes on a search for who left this anonymous gift for her. And it leads her to an unusual family um, that has this tradition of something called a Christmas jar. Now is this fiction or is this? Yes, this is fiction. Okay. Um, And the whole premise is that you take an empty jar and you put it on your counter and throughout the year you put all your spare change in that jar. And in the days leading up to the holidays, you find somebody um, who needs a little bit of hope and you donate that jar to them anonymously. I read the book and it just, I mean, I was just so taken by it. Why? What about it? Well, I was at a point in my life where I was still very busy with my kids and I was still searching for what am I going to do, you know, with the rest of my life and I wanted to volunteer for a long time, but yet I didn't have a lot of time to volunteer. I wanted to give back, but I didn't know how. And so I read this book and it was such a simple, simple concept. And I could teach my kids at the same time on what it means to give back or pay it forward. And in the book, that's what Hope Jensen finds when she uncovers this unusual family with this with this Christmas jar tradition. She learns a lot about giving back and, and giving anonymously, not having that pat on the back or those kudos for doing something that's just kind. It's not supposed to change anybody's life, but it's supposed to be enough to let somebody know that you care about them and that you love them and that they're not going through rough times by themselves. Um, and But anonymously. Anonymously. It's very important that it's anonymous. Why? Because I would think I would want to know that person loves me. I want to know who that person is. Um, some people, I think, are 
you know, they have pride. And so um, accepting a jar of money is very hard for some people. Mm -hmm. Accepting help, period, is very hard for people. So you read this book. And what, what do you do? Anything? Do you just put it aside? It's Christmas, you're busy, you're working, and you've got your family? What happens? No, I, I emailed the author, and I, I told him how much um, I enjoyed the book and that it really hit home for me for, for some reason, and that I was going to put a jar on my counter and do what I could to fill it as best I could um, in those few weeks. But then, going forward, this was going to be a tradition that my family you know, adopted. And everybody that came into Barnes & Noble that, that Christmas, they didn't leave without a, Christmas, a copy of the Christmas Carol. So you became a pusher? I became a pusher, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, I found that uh, even with, with hand-selling the book, I found that it was very much like uh, a pebble that you throw in a pond and you see the, the ripple effect. That's the way this was. I would, I, would give, I, I would challenge these people to go home and read this book and not come back and buy five or six or ten copies, one for everybody in their family. And every time they did, every time they came back and they would grab more copies. Did that surprise you in any way? No, it really didn't because I, I knew the effect that it had on me. Um, and I had, you know, handed it out to all my family and friends and, um, you know, pushed the book on them as well. And even people that were non-readers, it's a small book. Um, people would say, I don't, I don't read. And I'd say, well, you know, this is a small book. Take it home and read it and see what you think. And I had a, a, an older woman, and I've never seen her again, and she had come into the store, and she was traveling to Pennsylvania. Um, and she was just in, the, in, the, in town for a little bit. And so she said, I'm not a reader. And I said, well, just try this. It's small, you know, see what you think. And if you don't like it, return it. Well, um, in the story, um, there is a baby that is left um, at, a, at a diner. And um, this baby is, is raised, and she doesn't know her biological mother. Um, and that's early on in the story. Well, this woman who I had given this book to and asked her to read it came back um, in tears, handed me the most beautiful jar that she wanted me to use for my Christmas jar the next year, and she pulled out a picture of a woman, and she said, do you see this woman in this photo? And I said, yes. And she said, I only met her two weeks ago, and she's my biological mother. And so it, the story touched her in a different way right. than it touched me. And, um, you know, I found that it was, it, it's a safe book. It was a, a book that teenagers could read and get involved. It was a, a book that um, people could read to their families. They could read it together at night. And um, we, I know we sold hundreds of copies of Christmas jars. So the author has to become your number one fan. Um, he and I emailed quite a bit. Uh, back and forth, 